So Everclear, or Connext as we were formerly known as, um, is an interoperability protocol. We were one of the first intent-based bridges in the space. Uh, we kind of started building with intents back in 2020, 2021. Um, if you don't know what intents are, they are an approach towards bridging or doing cross-chain interactions where you rely on a third-party service provider called a solver to go and do whatever it is that you want to do on the target chain. Um, uh, this model has now become super popular because Uniswap did it. And so now that Uniswap X is done, I think there's a lot of a lot of projects, I would say just about every single bridge today is pivoting into becoming intent-based. Um, now Everclear specifically, uh, sure, uh, Everclear specifically, um, uh, what we kind of realized is that it, over the course of like trying to build an intent-based bridge for the past few years is that there's a, there's a shared set of problems for intent solvers. Um, one of the big problems is that solvers, as part of intent-based bridges, um, you know, they, they do this simple thing where it's like, uh, if you have funds on Arbitrum and you want to go and use uh, an application on another chain, for example, on Aave chain, um, the solver will give you funds on Aave chain, their own funds on Aave chain, to go and deposit into Aave. Um, and then at the end of the interaction, they get your funds on Arbitrum. And so, uh, you kind of end up in this interesting world where your funds as a solver um, move, right? You're, as a solver, your capital ends up moving from the chains where you used it to chains where your, your user is coming from. Um, so in this case, your funds as a solver would move to Arbitrum. Now, of course, this is not as, much big, as big of a problem for Arbitrum, but what happens if your user is coming from DGEN chain or from other, some other long tail L3 that nobody's heard from? Um, and this creates this like secondary problem, which we call rebalancing. Because as a solver in this space, regardless of whether you're a solver for, you know, Connext formerly, um, or across, or Uniswap, or really anybody, um, or any of the like dozens of other intent-based bridges, you have all have this single shared problem, which is you have to go and rebalance your funds. And rebalancing is just bridging, right? So you haven't really like gotten rid of bridging at all. What you've done is you've just shifted the complexity of bridging over from the place where originally is, which is like the, the user experience, over to the solver experience. And now solvers have to go and do exactly the same thing that the users had to do in the past. Um, what we realized was that Everclear allows you to have, uh, uh, it, what we realized is that this space actually needs collaborative solving. You need, you need the ability for solvers to work together to come out to like optimal solutions. Um, and in this case, what that means is that Everclear uh, solvers that are using Everclear can work with each other to net off transactions such that they, do, they don't actually have to rebalance in the first place. Give me just a second. Um, I had another set of slides. This is, like I said, my set of slides from the first day. Uh, I hope I can get... <laughs> I'll, let me send it to you. Yeah, it's the same one as, uh, as last time. Let me just send it to you right now. It's the same one as, the, as uh, at ECC. <laughs> um, yep. Here you go. Sorry for the confusion there. My bad. I should have pinged it again in the chat. Um, Anyway, today's talk is actually not about Everclear. Um, it's, uh, it's, or at least indir it's, it is indirectly. Um, today's talk is about restaking, because of course this is restaking day. Um, in today's talk, I want to talk about more broadly chain abstraction, um, what, why it is actually helpful. And I think that there's, there's of course been a lot of discussion on Twitter over the course of the last you know, six to 12 months around chain abstraction, why it's important. But there's very few things to show for it. And I think that this is maybe one of the things that uh, users sort of get confused about. It's like you have this big narrative that's narrative push that's happening on Twitter around, oh, amazing, thank you so much. Um, you have this really big narrative push that is happening around, uh, around creating chain abstracted apps, right? Around creating these experiences where users never actually really need to know what chain they're on. But in practice, this hasn't really happened for most cases. Um, and so what I'd like to do is talk about a bit of an exception case to this, which is, uh, which is Renzo. 
um, who were really the first protocol to jump on top of the, the like chain abstraction train um, and show that the ways in which that actually affected their growth. Because actually, it's very, very remarkable. Cool. So um, restaking is great. Um, we have an entire day dedicated to it. Uh, restaking is great because it allows us to be able to unbundle uh, the security of Ethereum and to be able to allow for renting that security to a bunch of different other projects, right? Um, but the challenge of restaking, and especially the way that it works today with, with most restaking protocols, is that it is fundamentally something that is related to the L1 blockchain. So as the DeFi ecosystem starts to move to L2s, you have this like weird situation where users need to actually bridge back to L1 in order to restake. Um, and this creates a bit of a, a misaligned incentives. Um, users, uh, I mean, L2s over the course of the last, like, not all of these are L2s, but L2s over the course of the last like couple of years have been doing everything they can to get users to move ETH off of Ethereum and onto L2. Why? Because ideally, in the ideal world, we're not ever actually transacting on L1s anymore at all, right? Um, ideally, we want users to get the benefit of like extremely cheap gas fees, extremely fast confirmation times, um, without having to deal with all the complexities of Ethereum. But you do have this like weird incentive misalignment where if LRTs are working only with Ethereum, now, uh, layer twos are not necessarily directly incentivized to support them. This is something that we kind of encountered with Renzo. Um, so when we, when we started working with Renzo, this was like February, March of this year. Uh, what month is it? <laughs> um, sorry, the crypto is crazy. Um, in February, March of this year, we started working with Renzo to figure this problem out. And what we, what we noticed was when we went and we talked to popular L2s like Arbitrum, they basically said, we really like Renzo. We want to get Renzo, Renzo users onto our chain, but we're not really incentivized to support them right now. And they weren't because supporting Renzo would actually mean reducing the TVL of Arbitrum, which is obviously quite uh, not ideal if you're an Arbitrum ecosystem builder. Um, but Renzo had this very simple design philosophy, which was as a user, right, Renzo wins if easy ETH is easy to get. It's in the name. Um, and, uh, and so the ideal user experience they wanted to create was it doesn't matter what chain they're on, you're on. If you're a user that's coming from Arbitrum, it shouldn't mean that you have to go bridge back to Ethereum to use the application. You should just be able to hit the restake button on their, app, on their application UI. This is actually a screenshot of their UI. You should just be able to enter some ETH in here, regardless of where you are, pay L2 gas fees, and then get easy ETH. This is the ideal user experience that you want out of an application, right? Um, uh, this is the, the like chain abstraction dream, is get to the point where as a user, you just, you're just paying L2 gas fees anyway, you don't know what's happening behind the scenes. So we kind of set out to work with them um, to make this goal possible. Um, now at the time, there, were, there was really nobody else doing anything like this, so it was, a, it was a very interesting kind of design challenge to get to the point where we could actually deliver this experience to, to Renzo users. Um, in a way that didn't compromise on like Renzo's security and on a bunch of other things that, that, the, that the protocol found important. And this is the architecture that we kind of came up with together. Um, you have this like core flow, right? The core restaking flow, which is a user sends ETH on L2 and then they receive uh, the XLRT, which in this case is X easy ETH. Um, the X there represents the fact that this is an XCRC20 uh, if people are interested, I'll leave some time at the end. You can talk a little bit. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that. But for now, just assume that this is a this is a, a token mint and burn standard. Um, actually, I'll touch on it quickly. A XERC20 is, a, is basically an EIP that is a standardized way to mint and burn assets between chains. It also contains within the definition of the EIP um, a a definition of how to limit the amount of a token that can be minted and burned. So there's in, there's basically inherent security measures that stop if, for example, a bridge that is minting. Uh, XERC20, or in this case, XEZETH, ETH, gets compromised, there's a limit to how many tokens can be minted. Right? So there's just like some added safety protections. Um, uh, so in this case, you know, as I mentioned, core flow, uh, the user deposits ETH into the UI and they immediately receive XEZETH. ETH. And then behind the scenes, and this is kind of where things get interesting, all of this ETH piles up uh, on, the, on the L2, like basically in Renzo's L2 vault contracts. Um, that ETH is then periodically bridged back to Ethereum, basically to be restaked by the Renzo team. Um, they were typically doing this like once every few hours to once every 12 hours. These are also some like big boy bridges. Uh, uh, Lorenzo's like easy ETH restaking uh, happened at a time where restaking was really taking off. So there were, there were instances where like Renzo was bridging several million dollars at a time from a chain, which is kind of crazy, right? Um, and then 
uh, this restaked easy ETH is, uh, or sorry, restaked ETH is used to mint new easy ETH on Renzo's L1 contracts, which are of course interacting with Eigenlayer. And then the new easy ETH that is minted is burned, effectively. It's burned because up front, Renzo had already fronted the easy ETH that was needed for the user. And of course, they kind of kept a bit of a float between these two things. So they had pre-minted some easy ETH to make sure that there was enough capital available such that the system was never in a state of credit. Right? There was always a surplus of easy ETH in the, in the uh, a surplus of ETH in the system compared to easy ETH. Um, and all they really need to do was, was make sure that there was enough capital within the system to cover the amount of time that it took to actually bridge from L2 to L1, which as I mentioned, they did in batches. And the really cool thing about this architecture is, as a user, you are paying L2 gas fees. Renzo is the one that is actually paying all of the L2 to L1 gas fees. Um, because they're doing this in one single batch, you know, with a transaction that is worth millions of dollars, they're amortizing the cost of gas. So instead of every single user paying, you know, the $50 or so it would have taken to, like, at least to bridge to Ethereum um, or to do some kind of other interaction that involved Ethereum, uh, the user paid cents, and then Renzo paid one $50 transaction for a million dollar ETH bridge, which is pretty cool. How did this work? Um, this is actually the really like shocking case study. Um, we actually have further data as well, but I, I didn't get a chance to update this graph. Um, Renzo basically implemented uh, restake from anywhere here. <laughs> you can kind of see what happens next. Um, this was honestly, uh, you know, as a, as a project that has been focused on chain abstraction, focused on like delivering this user experience to users, we had been talking to applications for, I would say like six plus months at this point, saying, hey, you need to figure out a way to go and onboard users from other ecosystems. The reason that you are not growing and winning is because you are limiting yourself to a single chain. And most projects we talked to were like, we have no evidence to suggest that that's the case. Um, now, of course, of course it's the case, right? Of course, like this is just basic Web2 stuff. If you're sending your Web2 user to an entirely separate application to go and onboard into your app, you're going to lose them. Like in 95% of cases, you're going to lose them. Um, and Renzo, I mean, I think they realize this and they just decide to take a bet on it. Um, and you can see that when they implemented Restake from Anywhere, there was suddenly a massive growth in their TVL. This is basically the, the, the green kind of solid line is uh, is their total TVL at, a, at a basically at a given point in time. And then the, the vertical bars represent the inflows. So you can see that the, the level of inflows that they received into the protocol coming from, in general, other ecosystems skyrocketed once they implemented this, uh, this pattern. And you can also see that the, the the TVL was actually pretty widely distributed. Um, Arbitrum made up a pretty significant chunk of it. Um, there's actually, again, more, more graph there, unfortunately, that I didn't get a chance to update. But um, Linea, Linea uh, and a couple of other chains also then grew very significantly. Um, and you can see that like, they're, they basically started to capture all of these other users from other ecosystems that were a lot more diverse than your standard like L1 whales, right? And, uh, and this was the interesting thing that we saw is we, we kind of saw that there was like, there were a bunch of whales living on Arbitrum, a bunch of whales living on Linnea, who were people that were very, very married to being on that chain because they were earning like points or other kinds of incentives somewhere else that they didn't want to let go of. Right? Or um, they were just ecosystem funds, right? There was just like consensus is treasury or it was XYZ's you know, uh, uh, capital that was being deployed into this ecosystem. And so they didn't, they didn't have an interest to bridge back to Ethereum. These were all, this was basically all TVL that would have otherwise been completely uncaptured. So what are the, what are the kind of key takeaways here? Um, well, the first one is that chain abstraction works, right? This is, this is a very, very binary result. Um, you can, and, and I think over the course of the last like few months, we've seen more and more LRT protocols do, like a, adopt this pattern in different ways. And you've also seen a kind of similar response where LRT protocols that have gone and become chain abstracted have actually done far, far better in terms of growth than others. Um, and so we know now that yes, restaking from anywhere or making any application from anywhere uh, drives a ton of TVL, in Renzo's case, over a billion dollars in L2 TVL that would have otherwise never existed. Um, it also builds alignment, right? Um, all of a sudden, we went from Arbitrum saying, we don't really have an incentive to work with you guys, to them saying, hey, this is actually one of the fastest growing things in our ecosystem. We are going to you know, throw incentives at it. We're going to market it as much as possible. Um, as part of this, right, like, uh, uh, Connext at the time, now Everclear, Connext became 
the best way to get into Arbitrum because we were bridging so much ETH out of or so much ETH out of Arbitrum to mint easy ETH that ETH in, inbound inflows into Arbitrum became steeply discounted. And so like we were effectively paying users like in some cases like up to 1% to bridge into Arbitrum, which is kind of crazy. Um, XCRC20 as, an, as kind of this like open standard helped to facilitate this growth, right? Uh, token standards, especially like EIP token standards that everybody can, can like agree on rather than kind of proprietary ones, helped drive a lot of growth. Um, and it drove a lot of growth for Renzo because it also allowed them to work with a bunch of other ecosystems, right? So like for instance, for Blast, um, Connects at the time was not really deployed there, so they were able to work with Hyperlane. Um, and this works because Hyperlane, Connects, a bunch of other ecosystems all support this like shared token mint and burn approach. And also, kind of importantly, all this happened with minimal risk to Easy ETH. So, like, at any time, even though there was like billions of dollars of Easy ETH outstanding, the total amount that was actually losable as a result of bridge hacks was much, much, much lower because of the rate limits. And then, lastly, kind of obvious, but going to where your users are makes sense, right? Like, this is just basic Web2 product stuff. Don't make your users come to you. As part of this, we also ran into some challenges, right? This was the first time that anything like this had ever been built. Um, and at the time, we, and I think every single other bridge, even today, it was kind of dealing with just bottlenecks to growth. Um, one of the big bottlenecks for bridges is just how do you actually support every single chain? Um, this is a problem that we've kind of come to realize is not necessarily solvable. Uh, there are just like operational and liquidity limitations to scaling to every ecosystem. And so as you, as you start talking about like, you know, Renzo was, was sort of saying like, okay, we were, we were trying to like launch one chain every couple of weeks or so with them. But eventually they were like, hey guys, we want to be on like hundreds of chains. We want to be in, on every single chain. So it became this open question of like, okay, how can we scale this model in a way where you can actually have easy E3 staking completely from anywhere, right? Because it's, it's in the name, um, but it wasn't actually entirely true. Um, liquidity was another big bottleneck. Um, the model that we proposed had some limitations around liquidity. We needed to make sure that there was enough easy ETH available on L2, and in order to do that, we need to make sure that there was enough like ETH uh, liquidity to, or basically enough liquidity to swap out of ETH on L2 within our protocol. Um, that ultimately ran into some challenges, right? We were able to bootstrap millions of dollars of ETH for this. We were still kind of delivering pretty good pricing, but it was not going to be perfect pricing. And that, that was something that we, that actually led to a lot of the thinking that ended up becoming Everclear afterwards. Um, and then rebalancing. So uh, as I mentioned, there was just massive, massive capital flows moving from L2 to L1. Um, it made sense to do this through Connext because Otherwise, Renzo would have had to take this like seven day lockup on their capital, which of course increases the amount of easy ETH credit that they need outstanding. Um, but moving very, very large amounts, again, like tens of millions of dollars of ETH a week at least, right? Moving, moving that amount of ETH from L2 to L1 just creates rebalancing requirements, right? You're just creating all of this unidirectional flow that needs to be counteracted. Otherwise, someone has to go and take that seven day exit. These are kind of the problems that we have realized actually exist not just for Renzo, but throughout the space. Um, large scale capital flows between chains, regardless of whether this is happening by protocols like Renzo, whether it's happening by intent solvers, like I talked about earlier, market makers, centralized exchanges, actually everybody, every really major actor that has money and is moving it between chains is running into this problem in some way, shape or form. Because ultimately, we are all dealing with the fact that we have a seven day exit window, right? That is, that is like one of the biggest market inefficiencies that exists in the space. Um, and so to address this, we've kind of built Everclear as this like alternative system that sits underneath something like Connext that can power things like Renzo in a way where Renzo doesn't have to uh, take this like seven day exit or pay tons and tons of money to bridge out of L2 chains. And the side benefit that you get out of it is that Everclear as a system that is not necessarily, as I mentioned, it's sort of negotiating uh, negotiating agreements between parties, right? It's, it's basically netting out the flow of funds rather than having, you know, $420 being moved between chains. It's negotiating relationships between the different chains to net out the flow of funds such that you only need to do one like finalized $10 transaction. Um, this kind of a system is fantastic because it doesn't need liquidity. It's not a TVL based system. It's a flow based system, right? It's, this is how clearing houses work in traditional finance. Um, and this kind of a system does scale. It allows us to be able to go and process like hundreds of millions of dollars worth of ETH flows from L2 to L1 with really no consideration, no like limits, right? There's, 
uh, this system can be deployed on every chain effectively instantly. Um, it's largely permissionless. And it allows for protocols like Renzo to be able to go and scale without actually needing to be bottlenecked by a single bridge. That's kind of my uh, spiel on restaking.